Kitty, how are you guys doing? Uh, you're fantastic. Uh, for those who are joining us for the very first time, my name is Shadi. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm privileged this morning to share the Word of God with us. And uh, this series, particularly this season, um, I'm very passionate about uh, what we're going to be talking about this, uh, this month. And we're going to be talking about the church. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, um, even just as we engage together. And this question came from one of us. A couple of weeks ago, we were just praying in our morning prayer. And uh, I was praying with someone and, and I asked the person, how can I pray for you? And, and, and the person just looked at me and, and said, what, what's the point? What's, I'm, I'm struggling with all these things that we do as church. What's, what's the point? Um, and I've been thinking about it. Um, it was like a month ago. I've been th just thinking about that. And I figured that it is important if we all are on the same page uh, when we talk about the church. So if you could allow me to ask you a question let me ask you this how would the world be if the church never existed how would the world be if the church never existed have you ever thought about it how how would the world be how will your family be if the church never existed like we didn't have this whole thing about faith and as I was asking myself that question, as I allow you just even to process that question, I want to throw in another question, okay? And it's a reality that um, I've experienced in my own life. This is not something that I've had with someone. It's my own life I've experienced. What if we get to the end and it was a lie? <laughs> what if we just get to the end and it's like there was nothing like life after death? What if we get to the end and it was a lie, you know, and it was a hoax, um, you know, it was a pyramid scheme. <laughs> what if we just get there and it's like, man, we wasted our time, we wasted our resources um, to get at the end. And I've asked myself that question a couple of times, not once, a couple of times. And, um, and I asked myself, what if I get there and... This was all a lie. You know, I've given myself to something for all my years and then I get there and there's no life after death. And when I was asking myself that question, something else creeps into my mind. And it was a, a different question. It says, what if it's true? What if, what if we get to the end and it's true? You know? What if, uh, you know... What if the end happens today and it's actually true there is life after death? And I started just thinking about that, deeply just thinking about that myself, personally, myself, not even my wife, not even my children, me personally. If I get to the end and it's true. This is a question that I've really, people have struggled with. People have left faith because of the same struggle. And then I came across this um, uh, statement as I was just doing my research. It says, I'll rather get to the end and realize it was not true, but I was ready if it was. Than get to the end and realize it is true and I'm not ready. Amen. That I'll rather get at the end and I realize, oops, it was a hoax. But I was ready if it was true. Rather than get to the end and I realize, oh my God, there is life after death. And death is one thing that we don't talk about. It. You don't hear death being talked to about in church. You don't hear grief and losing someone. And one person wrote and said, the reason why death is so painful is because you'll never see that person again. That's the, that's the only reason why it's painful. It's because it's over. In other words, it's game over. But what if we get there, and again, and it's true. 
So this whole month, we are going to just process and circle around that question. And the question we'll be actually answering is, what's the point of all this? And I concluded my, for myself, this is for me personally as an individual, I'd rather suffer the pain of disappointment than the pain of regret. Let me explain what the difference is. If we get to the end and it was not true, I'd rather suffer that pain of just being disappointed. Oh man, I gave my whole life to this. Didn't work. Than suffer the pain of regret for the rest of eternity because it was actually true. And I regret that I never lived my life preparing for this moment. And there are many people that have written books, quotes that have been written online. And one person wrote and said, I wish God gave us a date for our death. Then maybe we will prepare well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So what is the point? What is the point of the church? The church has been an integral part of our communities for centuries. And many of us were initiated in the church. Many of us, when it was not our choice to be in the church. Many of us, we found our parents going to church. They found their parents going to church. And we were initiated to that. That we have never gotten to that point of saying, by the way, what's the point? Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? And many will say that, no, you know, I, I found my parents doing this, so I do that. Oh, I found people doing this, so I do that. I was born in this family, so I continue doing that. But many of us, and maybe you're here today, you have never consciously just posed for long enough and asked yourself, so what's the point? What's the point? And our series will be just around that. And for centuries, the church has been doing this, trying to circle around that question, just helping people get to the end. And whenever somebody dies, they call a pastor to come and share the last words. And many people have written about their last days. People have left wills. People have talked about death. People have talked about when they are gone, what they desire things to be done. But one of the things that we never actually process is that who, us who have been left behind, they're waiting on the line. And the difference between me and the person who went yesterday is that I don't know where I am in that line. Praise the Lord. I might be so close to the line that I thought. Or I might be a few years, a few months, a few weeks from that line. And the challenging thing is that for people who have known and, and people have actually written their wills because they knew, they felt it. They felt it in their bones that it's time to go. And they put together a will and just telling people, guys, this is what I want you to do with what I've acquired in this life. Because once I'm gone, I will not have control of it anymore. Praise the Lord. And the church has been in the middle of those conversations. The church has been in the middle of those situations, those difficult moments. I, I know I've been in places where people are grieving and I'm, I stand before them and I don't know what I need to tell them. Because they will never see this person ever again. And as a church, we have been put in those places whereby we are so sober when we find one of us or somebody we know that has passed on, that in a moment it feels like, oh, oops, that could have been me. And it is sober as that few moments. But the interesting thing is after a few weeks, after a few days of just going through the process, somehow we get to tend to forget and we start going back into that illusion of life and the church has been put as a center by God himself for the purpose of his mission for the purpose of his plan that the church does not exist just to tell people of the good things the church exists to advance the mission that God already started praise the Lord so God's first primary purpose was and is 
to create a people for himself. That's the primary purpose of God. That God is in the business of creating. He created people for himself. That I don't exist for myself. And if I forget for a minute, then I will live a life that is not worth the call that God desired in my life. And the church exists to be at the center to help us understand that you were not born for yourself. It was for a greater purpose. And if you forget that, you live your life as if you live forever. And as you look at the scripture and you look at the Bible, and you guys have Bibles at home, just look at the Bible and look at the stories that are in the Bible. Every story is about God chasing a people for himself. Every story from the beginning is about God. It started with God, it will end with God. And he is in the business of ensuring that he is pursuing a people for himself. And the church is important because the church is what God now is using to pursue a people for himself. So if a church is not doing that, then it ceases to be a church. If a church is just for the sake of miracles, if a church is just for the sake of making you feel good, then that ceases to be a church. Because the church should be joining God in the mission of pursuing people for himself. And that's what God has been doing. And God has begun the church. God, it was his idea for him to start a church. Because when he said, I'm going, I'm going to sit right at the right hand of my father. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will operate in my space. Chasing a people. Loving them. And drawing them to myself. That friends, if you're living your life and it's not for God then you'll find that you'll waste a lot of your life. Because it is for God's purpose that you exist. That in other words, God never made a mistake for you to be born in the family that you were born. He had a specific purpose. God is not mistaken when things happen in your life the way they are happening. There is a specific purpose. And that purpose has to circle around pursuing you for a relationship with him. So that is the goal and that's what we want to do and that's what we want to say to church. And if you are to engage in a church, if you are to give your money to a church, if you are to even give your time to a church, at the end of the day, that church has to use that resource and that time and that talent to ensure that we are pursuing people for a relationship with God. We are pursuing people for a relationship with God. And in the book of Matthew 16, verse 18, this is what it says. And I tell you, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of heads will not overcome. And giving you just a context of this story, Jesus comes to his disciples. He has been working with them for some time now. He looked at them and said, what are people saying I am? Who are people saying I am out there? And everybody started saying, hey, you know what? I've heard people saying you're the prophet. Other people are saying you're this. Other people you are saying you're that. And Jesus recognized that at that particular moment, that it seems like the people who are outside didn't really, really get who he was. And then he brought it home. He looked at his disciples and said, and who are you saying that I am? And Peter lifted up his hand and said, you are the Messiah. You are the chosen one. You are the hope of the world. And Jesus says to him, upon that confession, upon that truth, I will build my church. That the church has to be built upon that truth. That Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That there is no other life that exists outside that life. That he is the way. And he is the one that is building the church. We are not the ones building the church. We are vessels being used by God to build the church. There are many times that um, I've got an opportunity to be discouraged. 
But the Lord reminds me, hey, it's not your church. The only thing that is here uh, that is yours, it is your wife and your baby. So be concerned about that. That there are many times people have asked me, do you even lose sleep because of the church? I don't. Because the church is not mine. And I'm not the one building the church. God is the one building the church. He says, upon that truth. My job is to know the truth. Because upon that truth, God is building the church. And our job is to effectively join God into the mission. Let me ask you a different question now. How will the world be if the church fully lived out its original purpose? How will the world be? How will our businesses be if we really, really, truly lived out our purpose as the church? How would our families be if the church truly lived out its purpose? How would our companies be? How would our engagement be? How would our commitment be if really we really lived out our lives as God had intended at the beginning? I am personally convinced, guys, if we operate in that purpose, we will see life being changed. We will see communities being transformed. We will see people, broken people being taken care of, poor people being taken care of. We will see love being brought back into our society. But above all, guys, if we live in that purpose, we will see God's glory being manifested. And at any particular time, I'm going to give you this as, as an assignment. Just go and watch the news. And sometimes you'll be depressed of what is happening in the world. And you wonder, where is the church? And you wonder if as a country we are 78% Christians. And we are the same people that are doing the things that we are seeing outside there. How would that be if we really lived out fully our purpose? I guarantee you, the world will be a different place. Families will be different. Children will be different. Teenagers will be raised different. They will have a different view of life. But friends, what's the purpose of the church? Now that I've said all these things, what is the purpose of the church? Why should you as a person belong to a local church? A guy that I love wrote a quote, Bill Hybels. He says, the local church is the hope of the world. That after many years in his engagement, he said that the church should be the hope of the world. And if the church is not giving people hope, then there is no hope in the world. Because the church know what it really means to hope. The church really knows what it means to wait. The church really knows what it means to be a church. But as I give you guys the purpose of the church, and just to give you just a few things that we need to agree on. Number one, we need to agree that there is a problem. When you look around you, there is a problem. When you go into the place where you're working, there is a problem. And that problem, its root cause is sin. That sin is the problem. Whenever you find yourself in a situation whereby things are challenging or things are hard, the person you're, not, you're dealing with is not the problem. The problem is sin. If you find you and your wife struggling in your marriage, the problem is not the person. The problem is that sin is the problem. And as long as, friends, you're here on earth, sin will fight for your soul. The devil will do anything to get you. The devil will entice you with anything just to get you. Sin is the problem. And that is not the only problem, guys. Let me tell you another problem that many of us have not been told. The wrath of God is as real as the love of God. Now we hear about the love of God and we enjoy the love of God. But let me just bust your bubble for a moment. That the wrath of God is as real as the love of God. Of God and because God is holy God will not tolerate sin so as long as you're engaging in sin remember that you are a candidate of the wrath of God and it doesn't matter the opinion people say when the time comes and you're gone you'll face the full wrath 
of God. It doesn't matter the opinion. It doesn't matter the article you wrote about who said what. It doesn't matter. When that time comes, the Bible says that uh, it is for a man, that the man will die once and next is judgment. And the wrath of God will be fully expressed on you. And the reason why God who is good, and people have had this as a struggle, why would a good God, you know, you know why would a good God do the things that he does? Because he is not just a good God, but he's a just God. And because of his, him being faithful and just, that the penalty of sin is death. And I was sharing with some friends yesterday and I said, whenever you engage yourself in sin, there is a relationship that is being broken. And it's not just the relationship between you and God. There's a relationship that is being broken. For those who are married, you know that. If one of you is engaging in sin, your relationship between you and the other person is broken. Because sin is in the world for the purpose of destroying relationship. So there is a problem that is sin. We have to agree on that, guys. And then there is another problem, which is the wrath of God. Which is as real as his love. And whatever he has said, he will accomplish. And then the third thing that we need to agree in, there is a solution. There is a solution. And the solution was that someone had to die. That's the solution. Someone had to die. That for sin to be fully covered, someone had to die. And for many generations, God tried to just pardon the sins of men by giving the blood of animals. And they will tell them, if you sin, go you sacrifice this. And that became the trend. And somehow people found it as a pattern where it's as long as you have goats, you can actually sin and go and give your goats. And you go back again and you do something and you give something else. And then it became a pattern. And God had to now give one gift, which was Jesus Christ, that he had to die. And we have to first agree that as a church, that there is a problem. And it's not just sin, that is the wrath of God. And there is a solution, and that is Jesus Christ. A church that does not understand that, it ceases to be the church. Because I'm going to tell you this for free. It doesn't matter how good you are. If you do not accept the gift that God has given, you will face the full wrath of God. And friends, it's good that I'm telling you early. Because the time is now. And the solution is one. That the church has to say this. Before even we talk about anything else. We have to say this, that there is a problem, there is a God who is just, and also there is a solution. And now that, friends, we have agreed on that, let me tell you now what the purpose of the church is. Are we together? Now that we have agreed that there are these three things that you personally have to do that, that I will not be able to stand on the gap for you, that you have to personally, personally do that for yourself so the purpose of the church the church exists for five things okay the church exists for five things and i'm gonna give you guys on the screen right now the, the church exists to evangelize the world the church exists to evangelize the world the second thing is the church exists for ministry and I'm going to explain to you what the difference is. And then the church exists for worship. Because God is building a people for himself. Then the church has to be worshipping God who is the king. That the king has to be worshipped. And that's the purpose where he creates a people for himself. The third thing is the church exists for discipleship. The church exists to edify and grow people into maturity. And then the last one is the church exists for fellowship. The church exists for fellowship. And this whole month, we're just going to pick one and just go through it so that you understand. Because as long as you are 
part of our church here, you need to understand what we are doing. So that when I ask you, give your money, you know why I'm asking you to give your money. When I ask you, give your time, you know why I'm asking you to give your time. When I ask you to give your space so that people can meet and engage, you know why that is so important and why we are doing what we are doing. So, for many people, you have heard about ministry. And most charity organizations, this is what they do. They do ministry. They serve the community. The church exists to be able to serve its local community. That we need to serve Siokimao. That if there are guys sleeping hungry in Siokimao, we are failing as a church. Because we need to serve them. That is our purpose. That's why God has put us in this community. If there are things, if there are kids being addicted into drugs and stuff, we need to go out into the community and serve them. In other words, we need to be the light of the world. And let me tell you, our world is here. So we must engage and serve the community. A church that only serves the community that way and never evangelize and never worship and never disciple, never fellowship, it ceases to be a church and it is only a charity organization. It's no longer a church. A church that only does evangelism will have many people that are immature. They're not growing. A church that only worship God, you'll worship two of you. Because no one is going out and reaching the community. Cease to be a church. So as a church, we need to live these five purposes and we need to balance all these five purposes. That's why it's so important that you join in. Because if I am a pastor and I'm, I'm passionate about evangelism, there is a tendency of me pushing the agenda for evangelism. That's why I'll get another pastor who is passionate about worship so that they can push the agenda for worship. That's why we'll ask you to step in and come in because some of you will be passionate about discipleship and we push the agenda for discipleship. That at the end of the day, we are balancing on what God has purposed for us to do. But the challenge comes in, guys, when many of us think that the church exists to tell us of the blessings of the Lord. And we think that the church has to, oh, you know what, you guys need to do this series because this is what I'm going through. If we become the center of the church, the church sees to be a church. If our felt need becomes the center of the church, then the church sees to be a church. The church should care about the needs. The church should address the needs, but the needs should not be at the center of the church. Because whenever you, you come into a church and you know God wants you to be in that church, but that church is not meeting your felt need, then you will leave. Because you think the church should be there to meet your felt need. The church exists to meet our real needs. And the real needs for the world is the church exists to deal and tell people that Jesus is the only solution for sin. Because sin is the problem. Praise the Lord. So, whenever we, we want to start a, a new program in our church, we ask ourselves, is this serving the purpose of the church? If it's not serving the purpose of the church, it can be a good program. We love it. It can be a good program. But guys, let me just tell you this for free, and I want you to understand this because it's important. We can't start everything. Hmm. We can't start everything. But there's one thing that we can do over and over. We can do church the right way. We can tell you what the purpose of the church is. We can do series that pushes you to know that, oh man, I exist for the purpose of God. So I need to be part of what God is doing. And just again to bust your bubble, we are not beginning the work. We are joining God who has continued doing the work from the beginning. And when we are gone, God will still continue doing the work. And when somebody else opens a church next to us, we will celebrate because what? They are joining God in the mission. Because it takes all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. And some of you, 
you will feel like this is not your, your, your right church. And that's why I usually tell this, and my team hates when I say this, find where you belong and plug in there. Find where you belong and plug in there. So this morning, I want us to look at evangelism and ministry. And I'm going to tell you guys what we're going to do and engage together. So evangelism and ministry is something that we have heard in the church. Many of you have already heard that. People have introduced you into evangelism. And I start the question by asking, when was the last time you shared your faith with someone? And many of us, maybe you have never. Some of us, it's five years ago. Some of us, it's 10 years ago. Some of us, you know, it's just the other day. Evangelism is not persuading people <laughs> to follow God. <laughs> Evangelism is telling people the good news. Let me tell you what the good news is. The good news is for you to know the good news, you need to know the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is there is sin, and sin is the problem. And there is a God who is all holy, all loving, but his wrath is as real as his love. And because of that, he will demand that everyone who sins pays that with death. Because the penalty of sin is death. So the good news is Jesus came in and took your place so that you can take his place so that you can live fully the purpose that he has given you. So that is the good news. And that is what we need to do as evangelists. That we need to go to the world and tell people, hey, this is the good news. This is the good news. This is the good news. I don't need to persuade you. I don't even need to, you know, to, to ask you five times, hey, do you want to give your life to Christ? Now I'm going to tell you the truth and then I'm going to allow you to be convicted. A healthy church is an evangelizing church. A healthy church is the one that goes into the community, loves the community, and shares the gospel with the community. That's a healthy church. A healthy church says, we are going. We're not going to sit and call people in. We are going to the community. So I want to ask you, friends, if you're part of this church and you've said, this is my church. Are you joining in in going to the community? And going into the community might be we go into the community and give food. And after giving food, we'll tell people about Jesus. Or it will be going into the community and clean the community. And as we are cleaning the community, we'll tell people about Jesus. Or it will be going into the community and, you know, and do a sports ministry or whatever. And as we do that, we tell people about Jesus. Evangelism has to be part of a church that is healthy. And many people wonder sometimes, how do I do that? There's a guy called Francis. This is what he said. He says, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Let me repeat that. Preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. In other words, when I'm going to my workplace, I'm preaching the gospel. The way I relate with my employee, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel. That whenever I will tell them about Jesus, they won't wonder, oh, and the way you treat us here badly. You say, yeah, oh, no wonder. No wonder you're so different. I was wondering what's different with you. Because by the time you open your mouth and share, they will say, oh, now I connect the dots. But many of us can't even say we are Christian in our workplace, right? Because people will, <laughs> will wonder. Actually, people will open our WhatsApp group to just discuss you. And say, will you scare you? Because they're like, the way you treat us, the way you do things, there's nothing Christian there. So preach the gospel at all times. With your children, preach the gospel at all times. That when you use words, your children will say, ah, oh, now it makes sense. Are we together? Preach the gospel and use words when necessary. And I want to give you guys a strategy that we're going to use to the church and just on how we're going to preach. And I want to read this text. In the book of Matthew chapter 28 from verse 16. And then we will uh, we'll dwell more on verse 20, verse 18 and 20. Verse 16 begins 
by saying that Jesus has resurrected, just giving you a context after death. This is the first time he's hanging out with the guys. He tells the 11 disciples, Judas is already gone. He tells the, the 11 disciples, you go and wait for me. I'm coming. Go into a specific designated place. I will meet you there. And Jesus meets them there. And the Bible says some worshipped him, but others doubted. These were disciples, guys who spent three years with him. Guys who saw him being crucified. Guys who went in the tomb and saw the tomb that it was empty. But when Jesus appeared, some of them were like, I'm still struggling. I'm not really sure if this is real. And then Jesus with that, he says, guys, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And the reason why he was telling that is because guys were afraid. What will happen now if the person that we have been following is gone? That the Romans and, the, and everyone that was in charge at that particular time, they were coming for them and they were afraid. And he comes and tells them, guys, all authority in heaven has been given to me. And then he goes to the next, he says, therefore, without authority, therefore, go. Therefore, go. He says, without authority, therefore, go. One of the things I'm convinced, friends, is this. Some of you will only interact with you for a month or two. And some of you will be here for years. But as you interact with us, we want you, as you take the next step to go, that we'll go with the light that will shine. That whatever place you will go, you will shine there. That, that, is, that is, I'm convinced about that. That every time we do things here, we do it as if it's the last time we're going to do it. Because we know that sometimes we have only one opportunity with you guys. So that some of you will get new jobs. Some of you will get married and go to different places. Some of you will get opportunities and will go abroad. Some of you will just, you know, engage in different places. And when that time comes, Jesus says that go. Go. Our job is not to call. Our job is to go. So the question is, how are you going? When was the last time you actually went? And you approach someone and you said, I want to tell you about Jesus. I, 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 think, I think we just need to get someone from Javoitness to come and teach us how they do things. <laughs> because sometimes those guys are just resilient. They'll just knock at your door, I want to tell you about Jesus. And they'll tell you some stuff. Like, oh, okay. And as we continue, as, as the world continues to advance... Uh, in, in knowledge and stuff, it seems like the, the church continues to diminish because we no longer go. We now live in gated communities where before I, I can even talk to you about something, I can't even get into that gate. And over and over, they are shutting and the world is shutting the church out. And the church now has opted in. Instead of going, what Jesus said, we will call people in. And there's one thing that you need to realize, friends. And it's something that as a church we need to realize. A person who doesn't know God will not care about what we do as a church. So it doesn't matter how much we call them, they will not show up. But let me tell you, if a person sees that you have taken your time to go to them, then they will give you time. And you as the light... You as the person who is going, you as being the church, when you go to that one person and tell them about Jesus. Imagine if all of us tell one person this year about Jesus Christ. Oh man, the church will change our community. So Jesus tells them, you guys go, go, make disciples, go. And they thought that they, they didn't understand what this going means. And then what happens after Jesus ascended is that there was persecution. And persecution pushed these disciples to actually go. It pushed them. Some of them didn't want to leave. Some of, some of them, this is what they knew how to do in their community, in their families. But persecution caused them. It was not an issue of just separation, but it was a multiplication. And every place that they went, the scripture says, they advanced the mission because everyone knew what it was required of them there are many of us who really know what is required of us when we are together but when you are alone you're like ah oh, man this is not for me 
Friends, it is you. Jesus is talking to you as a person. He says, go. Go tell that friend. Go tell that father. Go tell that mother. Go tell that child. Sit down with your children and tell them, do you guys understand what it means to be a Christian? And explain that to them. Go to the whole world. Make disciples. We go because of three things, guys. We go because, first of all, it's a command. In other words, you have no choice. Jesus commanded us to go. Buenas sana. This is not me telling you. This is Jesus saying, I have commanded you to go. And persecution caused them to go, even those who are not willing to go. They had to go. We go because God loves people, and so should we. We go because God loves people. He says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we go because of that. We go because we love people. I love this community. So we go to them and tell them, guys, we're going to give you food or we're going to do this. And then I'm going to tell you about Jesus. We're going to talk about it. I'm going to preach the gospel. And if necessary, I'm going to use words. The third thing is we go because we have the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, When the Spirit of God comes upon you, you shall be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and the rest of the community. It says when the Spirit comes, so when you, if you are convinced you have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will drive you to go. Not to call, not to wait, to go. And you're going to tell them about Jesus. So when I was start thinking about the things that uh, we are supposed to do, why we, sh we should go, I started thinking about what makes us not go. And it came out uh, with four things. The first one, we don't go because we are afraid. We are afraid. We don't know what the person will say. We are afraid of the response of that person. We are afraid of the awkwardness. Have you ever been in a place where you really want to talk about Jesus but it's awkward? It's like, uh, how will I start this conversation? How will they respond to this conversation? We don't go because of awkwardness. We don't go because we are afraid to fail. Friends, going doesn't mean that you have to convince them to respond by saying yes. Going is you going and sharing. The response is up to them. The next thing is, we don't go because we feel like it won't make a difference. We don't go because we're like, will it really make a difference? Will it really make a difference if I share my faith with my boss? Will it really make a difference? You know, my boss is from this country. It won't even make a difference. That's, that's the reason why some of us don't go. Because we're like, will it really make a difference? The third reason why we don't go. We don't go because we think there are other people who should be doing that. <laughs> we don't go because we think, oh no, there are people. Um, no, that's why we have pastors. They should be doing that. The commission was not for pastors. The commission was for all of us. And the fourth, fourth thing is, we don't go because we don't know what to do, nor what to say. I was there for many years. I knew that I wanted to, I, I was supposed to go. I knew that was required of me, but I didn't know how. You know, and I tried one day sharing my faith with someone and it, it, it didn't go well. <laughs> It went, shh, um, the guy started asking me a question that I couldn't answer. And that brought a lot of fear in my life. And for many years, I struggled with that. I didn't know how to do that. And maybe some of you, when I say going, you're like, how, how do we do that? How do we actually go? What do we say? Because not, right now you can't go and knock someone's door and tell them, I want to tell you about Jesus. How do we do it? How do we do it as a church that we live out our purpose? As, as healthy as possible, going out and evangelizing the world. So um, uh, after many, many just hours of looking through, um, I, I came across this. Um, it, it's called Bless Practice, uh, a step, uh, a five-step path to relational evangelism. Because we are relational people, uh, there's a blessed practice that I want to teach you guys, and I want you guys to just go out and bless someone. And the blessed practice is an acronym. And this will be just our take home for, for today. The B stands for begin with prayer. 
Identify your one. Identify one person you want to share your faith with. And then consistently start praying for them. Before even you approach them, consistently start praying for them. Or if you don't have one, if you don't, you, when you look at maybe your, your, your phone book, there's no one that you know, is a candidate of you just going and, and sharing your faith. Pray that God will connect you with the one. You'll bump into a stranger. You'll connect into someone that you, you, know, you never thought you'll connect to. And begin praying for them. Begin asking the Lord to give you courage. Begin asking the Lord to give you opportunity. Begin asking the Lord to just connect you. Somehow to make things work. That you find yourself in a place where you can actually share your faith. Begin with prayer. Everything begins with prayer. Guys, God is in the business of reaching his people, pursuing a people. So when you start praying, he knows you're joining him in the mission. I guarantee you this, he will come. He will join you into that work. Begin with prayer. The L stands for listen to the needs. Remember, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. So listen to the needs. Listen to what is happening in their lives. Find a good place to just engage them. If somebody is sharing with you and they, they haven't eaten for, for six months or they haven't had you know, an opportunity to even take their children to school because of school fees, it's a good place to just listen to that need. It is a good place as Christians to just sit and listen. And don't just pray for them. I say, oh, ah, we're going to be praying for you. Do something about it. Before even you start sharing with them, you know, ah, I'm going to tell you about Jesus Christ. And then they are worried about where they will get money for rent. They will not listen to you. So listen to the needs. And we usually say, listen to the said needs and the unsaid needs. Listen to what they are saying without saying. Listen to what they are saying without using words. Amen? That you can pick on what they are saying. It might be someone you just met, you're jiving together in the bus and you're, they start venting and complaining. Instead of thinking of them as if they are complaining, listen to what God wants you to hear. Friends, there are no coincidences with God. God will put you in a place because he wants a specific thing for you. And because you are the light, you need to shine that light, that opportunity. Listen, the third thing is that the E stands for eat together. Huh, better Together, eat together. This is a place where you invite me. This is what I usually do. When I meet someone, maybe it's a stranger, and, and some of you guys, you, you have experienced this with me. I will tell you, hey, can we do coffee together? Can we do coffee? We talk. Because I've listened, and there's something that you're saying to me, and I don't have that time right now. Can I just invite you? Can, can, you, can, I, can, can you come? Can I come over? When you eat together, there's something about food, especially with the African culture. There's something about food that just breaks the ice. And people just start telling you stuff. And then for you, you have now an opportunity to tell them, hey, you know what? There's a problem and that problem is sin. And there's a solution and that solution is Jesus. Have you ever given your life to Christ? And at that particular moment, they will be like, why, why should I do that? Why, what, what is the connection between that and what I'm going through? You're like, you just need to belong. You need to have a family. Just need to step on this other side. Being convinced that Jesus saves is one thing. Being convicted about that, it's another. So have you ever been convicted that you actually need a savior um, in this? So eat together. The, the third one, now that you have listened, you have been eating together, then serve them. There are many things you can do just to engage them. Serve them. Serve them. Say, and, and I've done this many times. I've met with someone and they tell me about what they are going through and we went to coffee and I avail myself. Hey, can I pick your child? Can I, can I volunteer myself to just come and pick your child and take your child to, to school or take your child to, to the hospital? I know right now you don't have the capacity, but can I just step into that place? Would you allow me to just serve you in that way? Would you allow me to serve in that way? Would you allow me to serve you in that way? And the last one, is that I need to share the good news. I need to share with them my story. I need to share with them. After I've done all these other things. That I need to come back and tell them. You need to understand. What is happening here in your life. You need a savior. 
and that is Jesus Christ. Preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. So as we even finish, I want to ask you again, who are you going to bless this week? Imagine if as a church we're going to bless one person. Every month you just choose one person to bless and share with them. And many times when I'm sharing with someone and they don't even receive Jesus Christ, I'm okay. I'm like, yeah, that's what I needed to do. It's not my job to save you. <laughs> my job is to share with you. Then up to there now I'll say, thank you very much. I'll continue serving you. I'll invite you into church. I will ensure that I'm there for you. And when the time comes, when the Lord convicts you, because uh, there are many people who, when you share with them their faith, they are convinced that that's what they need, but they're not convicted. So they will not make the step. Being convinced, many people are convinced about God, but they don't do anything about it. They need to get to a place where they are convicted. And conviction is something that you as a human being cannot do to another human being. It's only the Holy Spirit that can convince Con convict people of their sins. So a church that is healthy, a church that will change the world is a church that goes out and evangelizes, joins God in the mission because God is using the church as a platform to reach out and advance his mission. And the church is not the building. The church is you and me. And because we say here we are better, together, then we're going to go together and say, hey, why not just do this together? Why not just invite that neighbor into our fellowship? Why not invite someone to come and join this cavalry? Hey, I don't know how I'm going to share my faith with you, but I'm going to invite you and you'll be with people who can actually say those words. You know, you can be part of what the church is doing. So I'm going to ask you, who are you going to bless this week? Do you know someone? Do you have someone in mind that you need to just begin praying for? Is it a family member? You know? Is it someone that, you know, you have been praying for for a long time? Is it a friend that you just need to invite? Is it someone that you, you saw once in church and you've never seen them again that you just need to call them and get to know how are you doing? I have not seen you in a while. Friends, I want to challenge you just to pick one person that you say, I'm going to bless you this week. And for many of you, you will think that everyone is saved in your circle. And you're like, I think everyone is saved. Do not assume that the person sitting next to you actually knows Jesus. Buenas Fiesana. Ask them. Talk to them. Engage them. Tell them, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And maybe we'll finish that conversation. I've, I've been in such situation where I tell someone about Jesus and then I'll finish the, the conversation and they were like, yeah, I'm actually saved. I'm like, you could have told me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> could, have, could have just said that. Yeah. But I don't want to assume. I don't want to assume. I just want to talk to you about it. I'm going to bless you. I'm going I'm gonna, to I'm gonna take you. I'm going to eat. I'm going to spend my resource on you. I'm going to serve you because I want to be part of what God is doing. So guys, when I tell you to give yourself into the work, this is what we are doing. And the reason why we are doing it is because God is actually doing it. We are joining him. When I tell you to give your money, your tithe, and you're like, oh, why should I give a 10% of money that I've really worked for? Yeah, We're telling you, hey, this is what we are doing. We're ensuring that we are providing an opportunity for people to hear about Jesus. And Siokimao one day will be in different cities, different communities. Or maybe some of us will be here leading different things. You will see a difference by just you saying, I'm going to bless one person. For some of you, you can say, we're going to bless a couple. Maybe because you and your wife are like, oh, we know a couple that we can invite in our space and we start doing this together. Please do that. Maybe it's a friend. Please do that. Maybe it's your family member. Please do that that so question is who is your one and this whole month that's what we're gonna ask who is your one invite them to church you know and if they come to this church and they're like oh, man that church is for young people find a church where you can take them take them until go with them just i'll give you permission just go with them to that church and 
listen to 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 you know to to the sermons and if that church is a healthy church stay there until they plug in once they plug in you can come back sana because that someone that person is so important it is so important that we actually connect them to Jesus Christ challenge challenge so who is your one who is your one and friends like us to stand um, pray together and uh, as we go out let's let's do this next sunday bring someone invite a friend i've seen some of you have invited your friends invite a friend tell them hey let's go to church let's just do this together um, because we are better together again i'll finish by telling you guys preach the gospel at all times and if necessary use words preach the gospel at all time and if necessary use words go bless someone this week allow me to pray for us i want us to close our eyes and i'm going to be praying for us and there's some of us who are afraid uh, you're scared about that i'm going to pray uh, for you for courage just to, for us to just step into that space um, there's some of us who will just take this lightly and you're like oh, man it's never that serious i'm gonna pray that the lord will convict you that you're joining him in the mission it is not for us to have a bigger church it is for us to reach people for christ and allow them to plug in whatever place they f- they seem it's best for them and it will help them make that transition so with our eyes closed i want to ask you maybe you're here and you've never really been convicted you've never said those words lord i want you to come into my heart i want to give my life to you maybe you've never gotten into that place and maybe you're saying when you're talking about this you're like that's that's me i need to give my life to christ today i wouldn't want to finish without giving you an opportunity to do that and i want to ask just with the eyes closed just think deep in your heart maybe you've been convinced for a while that you need to do it but you've not gotten to a place where you're convicted we really need to work with you and get into the other side so if you're here and you're saying hey that's me just want to ask you to just shoot your hand up and put it down i'm gonna i'm gonna make this prayer for you um and then together we're just gonna finalize um our service today you're here you're saying hey i've, I've never given my life to christ i've, I've said that i want to do this but i've never done it um, as we talk about that, I want to give you guys an opportunity. So if you're here, just shoot your hand, um, put it down. I'm going to pray with you um, on that. Maybe you're here, you're afraid of going out and sharing your faith with your family, with your friends. There are people that you really know that you need to share your faith with. I'm going to also make a prayer for you. And Father, we are here with you. And you said where two or three will gather because of your name. You're in the midst and we know you're here. You're you're guiding us. You're leading us. You're growing us to just know you and know you better. And as a church, Lord, today we take up the challenge to join you into the mission. Because this is what you already started. That before even we planted this church here, you've already been at work in Siokimao. And you're using us, Lord, to join you into that mission. There's some of us who are afraid, who don't know how to start those conversations who even are just afraid of the response, the awkwardness. Father, I pray for courage, that as they choose that one person, as they start praying for that one person, that over and over they will allow you, God, to guide them and to lead them. And as together, as we look, God, to just grow together as a church, because we are better together, as we grow, as we invite friends, as we join into discovery, as we join into the things that we are doing, may we see you being glorified in this place. And now, Lord, may you take up, God, that challenge and help us God be able to just operate with confidence and for those who are afraid may we be able to do it afraid doing it afraid not knowing what the response will will be or or how the people will respond but we'll do it afraid and we'll see you God being glorified maybe there are some who came today and they still have doubts father I pray as they come that Lord you will minister to them and this whole month as we talk about the church may all of us as a church understand what we are called to do and may we operate with that every single day of our lives and as you're reminding us today that we preach the gospel at all times and use words where necessary i pray that lord will preach the gospel to our nannies at home to our friends to our co-workers
to people that we have employed in our company, people, people that we work with in our companies, Lord, would you give us that grace and the confidence and the strength. And now, Lord, I want to glorify you because of what you're sharing. And I know that you've spoken to each and every one of us. And now we know the point is that, God, you care about people and you care about a relationship with us. And we are here. Use us, Lord. Be there someone here who is saying in their hearts, I'm giving my life to Christ today. They don't even need to come in front. They just need to say it in their mouth and confess it that Jesus Christ is Lord, believing in their heart. Lord, you have said we'll be saved. And as they make that commitment, may they follow through God by allowing themselves to be part of a community where they can grow. And Father, we exalt you and we worship you. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to be here together. I pray even as we finalize our, uh, our psalm on this day, may you go ahead of us in the week. May you level every mountain. May you fill every valley. May you walk in, our, in every side, God, to protect us. May you walk above us to watch over us. And everything that concerns us, Lord, would you be part of it, Lord? Would you give us favor for some of us who need it this coming Monday? Would you give us strength for some of us who need it this week? Would you give us wisdom for some of us who need it, Lord? Would you give us peace for those who are asking for peace? Would you give us opportunities for those who are asking for opportunities? But above all, Lord, would you give us yourself that we may walk with you? And I pray this for your glory, Lord, and for the joy of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.